please stand in honor of God's word. Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. It's a call to remember. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not, excuse me, the things that are not done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this word this morning that was given to Isaiah, declared to be your word, given to men, passed down and given to us today. And as we read, Lord, we remember what you said, that you alone are God, that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator, our redeemer. We thank you, Lord, for this word, and we ask that through the preaching of your word this morning, Lord, that our hearts would be drawn close to you, that as we hear these words that you gave to speak to us, who are unworthy, Lord, to receive anything from you, yet you made yourself known to us, just as you gave your only begotten Son to be our Lord and our Savior. We thank you for these things as we remember these things. Draw our hearts and minds closer to you as we enter into worship this morning. Guide us, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, thank you, you may be seated. We have been speaking about the appointed times, seven appointed times, we began with actually the one that was, I guess, outside of these seven. The first appointed time was the Sabbath. The Lord said that you should set this day aside and no work be done, that this is a Sabbath unto the Lord. It is an appointed time. And then he went on to describe for us the seven feasts, which actually, I believe, are what are, what are re being referred to here in the book of Isaiah. Now, normally we've been starting in Leviticus uh, 23, and we'll take a look at that in a moment, but I want you to look, notice this, that the Lord is prophetically speaking that he is declaring what is going to happen at the end from the very beginning of time. He is declaring the fulfillment that there is a fulfillment for each of these feasts that's even alluded to in the, the feasts themselves when they're established. And we're going to be looking at the spring feasts, the feasts that demonstrate Christ in his priestly role on behalf of his people as our high priest. And we'll be looking at these four spring feasts that have already been fulfilled. We'll speak about and, and hear about the fulfillment of them as well. But I want you to take note as we remember, as he says here in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, remember the former things of old. So as you have read through the Old Testament, you think about these things that God did and the certain ways maybe you wondered how and why God did them a certain way, that he had meaning in all of it. And he said, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. And he describes what makes him different. This is the same sentence, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. That's a very important scripture to have and understand if you're going to try and, and decipher or understand what these end times are really all about. And, uh, and you know, you wouldn't think about it, but the feasts, the seven feasts are essential in understanding even the end times. Now, not always do you hear the feasts preached about when they talk about end times. And you've heard a lot of end time preachers and they talk about signs and they talk about different things like that. And they pull up Daniel and they pull up Isaiah and they pull up Ezekiel and they, they look at the prophecies of the Old Testament. But the Lord tells us that he declares the end from the beginning. And he's doing that in these feasts as we will see. Well, from there, I just want to read uh, Amos as you turn to Leviticus 23. 
uh, just briefly to, to catch up where we were. Leviticus 23, 4 and 5. But the book of Amos, chapter 3, verse 7 says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. So God is also telling us there through the prophet Amos that he is revealing these secrets. He wants them to understand that everything he does, he is revealing through the prophets. So we can look into the prophecies, the same prophecies that, that he told Daniel to take and seal up this prophecy until the end times. And now as we open up the book of Daniel, and we can see with along with the New Testament, we can see how that we live in these end times. We can see the meaning of the weeks and, uh, the, the, and all of the things that, that Daniel spoke of and how that many of them are coming to place. The things that were prophecy before, as, as many have said and noted, are headlines today. And so it's very important for us to realize that, that through these seven feasts of God, he reveals his plans for redemption, for equipping, for the witness of the church, and glorification of his church. All of those things revealed through the seven feasts. So let's take a look at what he says about this first of the seven feasts that we're going to take a look at, and that's the Passover. For that, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 4 and 5. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, we mentioned before that that word convocations also means like rehearsals. So it's a holy rehearsal of things yet to come. Even holy convocations which you shall proclaim in their seasons. And again, as we've seen in the videos, if you've been coming Sunday night, you've noticed in the videos that all of the feasts are tied around the livelihood of the, the harvest and the planting and the harvest of the, of the life of the, of the children of Israel, of God's people. Still today, all of these feasts are wrapped up in, in those events of planting and harvest. And so they never, from year to year, got very far away from the meaning of these feasts. So he goes on and he says, verse 5, In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. By the way, this is also the place where Abraham offered up Isaac, where the Passover was taking place. We know the Passover, uh, um, excuse me, not where it took place, but where Christ was crucified. The fulfillment of the Passover we know as Christ being crucified for the sins of of the nation for the sins of the world so let's go on in Genesis then in Genesis 22 and 8 we want to see one of the things that is provided in this Passover story the first of those is that they were commanded in Egypt to take a lamb one for each family and they were to slay that lamb gather the blood from that lamb in the bowl and, and uh, take a, a branch of hyssop and, and dip it in there and then wipe it on the, do the doorposts and the lintel of the, of the doorway. Three places that they were to wipe this blood. And, and, and then as the death angel came that night, uh, he would see the blood and pass over that house. But I want you to notice the first place, even before the law was given, remember God saying, I'm showing you from the beginning those things that I'm going to do. Genesis 22, verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God, will provide himself a lamb, a burnt offering, so they went both of them together. Now I spoke of Abraham and Isaac. Well, this was the time when, when God told Abraham, he said, I want you to take your son, your only begotten son, and I want you to take him, and it's going to be three days' journey to the place that I'm going to show you, to a mount that I'm going to show you, and there I want you to offer up your son Isaac to me as a burnt offering. And Abraham did not uh, question God at all. Rather, he just immediately gathered up his son and some wood, and he took two servants with him. I thought that was interesting, too. But he took two servants with him, if you read further or before in this story. And they went, and they went up together. And as it says here, 
Uh, when his son inquired as to, uh, Father, um, we didn't bring a lamb. If we're going to offer a burnt offering to the Lord, wouldn't we have brought a lamb? And so he makes note here, and this is where we find the first of those really prophetic statements that God will provide a lamb. That lamb that was to be offered, well, we know you see the typification or the type of of Christ in the Old Testament there in the son Isaac as being that, that son of promise, that only begotten son of Abraham, who would be the one he was supposed to take up to this mountain. And that mountain is also, by the way, the place where the, where the temple was built, where they would offer the sacrifices to God. That's why it's called the Temple Mount. That's why it's that place where, where Abraham offered Isaac. Now, there is also... Uh, a place there that we know is not uh, of uh, Judaism or of Christianity, and that's the Muslim mosque. And their Muslim version of this story is that Abraham offered up not Isaac, but Ishmael. Did you know that? Yeah. That's what they believe. And so that's why they also treasure that place and honor that place, but that is not the truth, and we have the record of it in the scriptures. But now I want us to move forward again to Matthew 1, 21, as we look at God providing his lamb to see the fulfillment of this. And this is one of those great fulfillments of Passover that God provided the lamb for the people. Back in the Old Testament, in, in Egypt, they were to get a lamb that they had. It had to be without spot or blemish, and it was to be offered. Now God is providing his own lamb to as his priestly role to offer it for the sins of the people. Matthew 1, 21, and uh, this is where we begin to see what this is about, what Jesus' role will be. And this is prophetic in, in when it was before Jesus' uh, birth, when he goes on to say that they shall, and he shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. These are the words of the angel, remember, prior to Jesus' birth. For he shall save his people from their sins. <clears throat> it's also said that he was to be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. So all of that was given as a, 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 a precursor to or a prophecy of what Christ's role would be. He would save his people from their sins. Next we can go forward to John 1.29. And if you like, you can just hold off on that. If you want to just listen, notice John 1.29 says, The next day, John, this is John the Baptist, sees Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God. John the Baptist saw Jesus as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, they would not know at the time when Jesus was to be born that that's what his role was to be, or, or unless they knew the prophecies of the Old Testament. And there's so many, many others. We could never uh, go into them in this short period of time. But you know that you've seen them before. But Jesus was to save his people from their sins, but he did that. He was going to do that, as we talked about already, by the shedding of his blood to save his people from their sins. And that's what's the purpose of the Lamb of God, was for to be offered up as a sacrifice for the sins. Then 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, we can take a look at this and also see, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, speaking of Jesus Christ, that Lamb of God, who became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Not apart from him, but in him. And that's why it's only in the name of Jesus. He is the only one who was sacrificed for us. He was the only one crucified on your behalf, taking on him your sin, removing that sin from you, that you might be the righteousness of God in him. Now, speaking of that removal of sin, we find also the second feast, that of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It takes place at the same time as the Feast of Passover. On the Jewish calendar, it would be Nisan, the 14th and the 15th, the evening and the morning. And in the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, it would be Nisan the 15th, and it would last seven days. 
for that unleavened bread, that for seven days they would eat unleavened bread. Well, what's the meaning of the unleavened bread? If you remember from the videos that we've been watching, that they would take and they would, they would gather their children and they would all go through the house with a little broom or a little uh, 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 whisk and they would search out the hidden pieces of leaven that the parents would have hidden around the house so that they actually searched the house to find all the leaven in the house and they would sweep it up and they would gather it together and they would all together as a family take it outside of the house and then it would be offered, it would be burned. That was a picture of removing the sin from that house outside of that house, you see? And that's the picture that's given here of Jesus Christ, that's the fulfillment, that Jesus removed our sin. He was the leaven that was sought out by the Jews. He was the one that, you know, remember in, uh, what is it, um, let me think, uh, uh, John 5 and 18. Um, the scripture says, therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him. Remember that? <coughs> because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. And that's why they sought to remove Christ from them. The Jews themselves, the high priest, sought to get Jesus and remove him from them. And what did they want to do? They wanted to kill him. They wanted to crucify him. Just as that, that leaven would have been taken out and as a living thing, you know, yeast is a living thing. And it's taken out and it's put to death. <coughs> Pardon me. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, we've read already before, comes from Leviticus 23, 6, and I'll read it for you. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Well, and we know that from, um, in Exodus, uh, they were commanded this. In, in Exodus 12, 15, it says, Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your house. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. That, because that represented they were sinful. And sin cannot reside in God's house. And uh, so they would be cut off. Well, we read already John 5, uh, 5 18 that the Jews sought to kill him, but then in John 18 and 3, we remember the words of Judas when they actually did find him and, and removed him. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests, <coughs> excuse me, and Pharisees, cometh hither, or thither, and, with lanterns and torches and weapons. And they seized Jesus there in the garden, and they carried him away. They searched him out as they would to, to uh, purge themselves of this man who they considered to be sin, who had committed this heinous crime, this uh, of claiming to be God. They did not recognize him as God. And they... Uh, uh, inspected and they indicted him uh, and the high priest found him guilty and, and uh, uh, said we must crucify this man and he got the whole crowd to say crucify him and so that's what was done they took the leaven and they moved, put it outside and so when you have the picture of Christ then these very same people that took part in that see Jesus Christ as the one who removed their sin and they will see that someday as the Bible tells us in Revelation that when after the church is taken out and God reveals his hand and his <coughs> excuse me, prophet to his people during the tribulation that they will see and come to know their Savior, who is Jesus Christ, the one that they rejected. Well, this feast also points back to that time as we alluded to where it began. This was also during that time of Passover that they were to purge their house of the sin as well as take that lamb and put its blood on the doorpost. But it signifies their deliverance from Egypt. And in Exodus 12, 17, the scripture says, And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this same selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations for an ordinance forever. So this feast actually points back to their deliverance 
from Egypt, which is also a type of deliverance from sin. We know this from Exodus 13 and 3, and I know I'm giving you a lot of verses, and, and you just wear your fingers out if you tried to keep up with me, but I don't know any other way to, to present this truth about these feasts other than to give you the scriptures. So I hope that you can follow with me on these. In Exodus 13 and 3, it says, And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by the strength of my hand, the Lord brought you out of this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. Out of the strength of God's hand were they delivered. And that's amazing, but it's also the strength of Christ who took upon himself our sin. We've talked about that before, that, that his crucifixion, and many times it's only portrayed as the, as the physical suffering. And as heinous as that is, that's not what required God to do. It required what God, excuse me, what was required for God or why God was required to do this was because it took God to remove our sin. Many people had been crucified. Many people had been. That was the, that was the method of, of death penalty in that day was crucifixion. But what, what it required God's strength for was on him he took our sin. Imagine all the sin of the world being heaped on him and him being made that sin for us in that same way as that leaven represented sin in the house. So Christ also then became that sin for us and was taken outside the city. It was our sins laid on him that was the great burden he bore. That the sinless Almighty Son of God humbling himself to bear our sins. That was the miraculous thing. That was the strength of the hand of God that took that, them out. That as he brought them out, he also brought us out. Acts 7, 37 says this. That is that Moses, this is the book of Acts 7, 37 this is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Like unto me shall, and you shall hear him. And he goes on in verse 38. This is he that was in the church. Notice, in the church in the wilderness. This is book of Acts talking about that it was God in the Old Testament when he called them the church. Now, literally, what he's talking about there, the word means the people called out. That's what church in the Old Testament there is meaning, the people called out. So that he was with the people that were called out and brought out, brought, brought out of Egypt, called out of Egypt, also called out of the world. Just as we know, he said, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. God brought them at that time out of the world as well as out of Egypt to be his people in their own land. And so that's it. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake unto him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Now those are the Ten Commandments that God gave to them on that mountain. He goes on in verse 39, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them. And in their hearts they turned back into Egypt. What did he mean by that? What is he saying? They returned to their sin. They returned to that place where they were. And it's, it's, it's interesting how that Egypt represented bondage and slavery, yet they chose not to obey God and to turn back to Egypt, which turned back to their bondage. And that's exactly what sin is today. We've said it before. God wants us to surrender to him. But if you surrender to Christ, he makes you free and free indeed. Yet if you surrender not to Christ, if you surrender to sin, you are in bondage under sin. It represents the same thing today. That sin is bondage. Why anyone would choose bondage over freedom in Christ, I don't know. But they did. They returned to their sin. 
So this is a time, a, a very really solemn time, when they would search their house and remove all sin. They would examine themselves, knowing that that leaven represented sin. It was a time for them to repent. And we've said before that how did they know what repentance was? Well, they, how did they know it was real? How, many people repent. They say, well, I'm sorry I did this. God, please forgive me for that. I, you know, and I'll never do it again. But then they do do it again. And, and the, the Jews look at it and say, well, the only way I know that it's going to be real is the next time I'm tempted for that thing, I don't give in to that thing. That's the only way I can know that my repentance was genuine if I don't do it anymore. Just like Christ said to them, go and sin no more. He's told us to live holy as he is holy. And so all these things Jesus did, so he accomplished this for us, taking away our sin like, he, like the leaven was removed from the house. By becoming sin for us, he removed it and nailed it to the cross, setting us free forever, paying in full our debt of sin. The next feast that we come to then is the free feast of first fruits. And we know this also took place in the third consecutive day. Remember, 14, 15, and 16. This is Nisan the 16th. This is the next day, 16th and the 17th. This is what he says in Leviticus 23.10. We've read this before. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you come into the land which I will give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then shall you bring a sheave of first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. Now this is interesting. Leviticus 23.11 says, And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted of you. But when? On what day? Not on the Sabbath, but on the morrow. After the Sabbath, the priest shall wave the offering. What day was Christ rose from the grave? Exactly. Do you see Christ demonstrating what he said from the beginning? Now he's fulfilling that he fulfilled this feast on that day when he waved the first fruits, on the day after the Sabbath, day after Saturday. That's amazing to me how God does that. I look to Proverbs 3 9. Now I want to say something about the first fruits, and this is important for all of us. Proverbs 3 9 and 10 tells us this, honor the Lord with thy, what? First fruits. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Out of the substance, what God has given you honors God with the first fruits, the top 10% of all your increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Now that's a promise that has a fulfillment if you will do it, if you will do it. Well, for that, we look forward then. I look forward from this about the first fruits of being honor to God. And I see in 1 Corinthians 15 that it says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So his resurrection taking place on this very day, the Feast of First Fruits, he's declaring in 1 Corinthians this is the fulfillment of the first fruits when Jesus, risen from the dead, became the first fruits of them that slept, of those that died. The next thing I want you to notice about first fruits is not only do the first fruits bring honor to God, um, but that we are now the first fruits of Christ. And we must also honor God by honoring Christ. And for that, 1 Corinthians again. 1 Corinthians 23, or excuse me, 15 and 23. We've already read 20. Now 23 says, But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, after, or excuse me, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. He's completing this description of Christ as the first fruits and then those that follow Christ. Now, how do I say that they're his first fruits? James 1.18. Of his own will begat he us. Now, think about that. We are birthed. They begat sons and daughters, whether they had children. So Jesus 
had children, and we are his children. We are the children of Jesus Christ. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That's in Christ that we have that. Isn't that neat? We are a kind of first fruits of his creation then. Born again because we are born of Jesus Christ. Well, the last of the first four of these feasts, we've already looked at three. The last one is Pentecost. The last of these is Pentecost. And it's, it's how many days later? Fifty days later. Right? Fifty days. He goes on and he, and he says from uh, what we have read before in Leviticus 23, verse 15, And he shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheave of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number fifty days. No doubt there. He knows exactly. He's saying fifty days and you shall offer new meat, uh, a new meat offering unto the Lord. So this is what that Pentecost is. It's 50 days after all of these things, these first three spring feasts. The last of those really is a time, uh, a meaning of, of the, we know it as the coming of the Holy Spirit was given. We can read that in Acts, Acts 2 and we'll take a look at that. But what is, it was also called the Feast of Harvest or the Feast of Weeks, but it's a Feast of Harvest. <coughs> and I want us to take a look, a special look at that. Turn to Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at the first four verses. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read you something out of Exodus 34. And the Lord said, Thou shalt observe the Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering, at the year's end thrice a year and he goes on to say and this is I thought significant because this is one of those feasts that the people were all called from all over the country to come to Jerusalem this was one of those feasts Pentecost they were all to come and bring this offering of the first harvest to the Lord and that's what he goes on to say thrice a year shall all your men children appear before the Lord God of Israel. It was an in-gathering, which this feast is. It's an in-gathering. And he goes on then, we look at Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as a, as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want you to notice something about this. This is the beginning. This is the beginning of the harvest of the church. And it, the Bible goes on to say that 3,000 souls were added to the church at that time. And many days, in the days that followed, thousands more. It's interesting also that at the time in the Old Testament when they were brought to the mountain of the Lord, and you remember during the time while Moses was receiving the word of God, the children of Israel that, that hardened their hearts against God and turned back to Egypt, uh, went back into sin, they made those altars, or they made that uh, 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 golden calf, and they began to worship that. And on that time when God judged that, 3,000 souls died, it tells us. Now here in the book of Acts, when God gives his Holy Spirit, 3,000 souls were added to the church. I think that's interesting, that God is reversing all of that. And so the Holy Spirit was given as the first great harvest, and it followed continually. Now one of the other things about the Holy Spirit, and, and, and this you get from what God has done, we find in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 13. And, and that is this, that once you are given the Holy Spirit, you are sealed with that Spirit. That you can never be lost once God has sealed you. When he has put a seal on your life, on your heart, Satan cannot break that seal. You cannot break that seal. No one has the power to break God's seal. 
you see what I'm saying? That's why we have those promises. No man can pluck you out of my hand. You see why he's never lost not one, he says. Why he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. In Ephesians 1.13, it says, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, notice, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You are sealed. That's where we get that once saved, always saved. Because once you have believed, once you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and he has attributed to you his, his sacrifice for your sins, paid your debt in full, he didn't just stop there by forgiving us. Sometimes we do that. We might forgive someone, but we won't forget it. He didn't just forgive us and leave us out there. No, he brought us in and gave us a promise. He restored us. And that's what this is about. Not only did he pay the price on the cross, but in, in the giving of his Holy Spirit, he gave us the promise that we will always be with him, that we will always belong to God. He re reiterates this in 2 Corinthians 1 and 21 and 22 when he says, Now he that establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. God is the one who has anointed us with that Holy Spirit. God is the one who has established us, settled us, and made us uh, together one. And he goes on in verse 22, Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Now, the only thing I can make as a comparison to earnest is earnest money. You ever make a purchase, a large purchase? You put down what? Earnest money. What does that earnest money say? I'm going to fulfill my promise to buy this. I'm fulfilling my promise. And Jesus made that promise and gave us the earnest of his spirit. It's also paid in full. And here's part of it. He also, then he put his spirit to live inside of us. This, the, the, that's what Acts says, that the spirit came on all of them and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And we find that that filling and that is always present there. You can, we can go on and talk about how that's also the baptism of the Holy Spirit as well. Because it's the one that only God can do. It's not water that saves us. It's the Holy Spirit. It's God. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's the promise of God but that seals us unto that promise that he made. That's why we are the children of promise. We are the children of the new covenant. Just a little bit, we're going to be observing this, one of those ordinances of the New Testament, the new covenant in his blood. So I, just to, to recap, in these first four feasts, we find very, for these major four themes, these major four doctrines, these major truths founded in each of those. Briefly, that Jesus' blood delivers us from sin and death. His blood applied to us. The death angel will no longer, will, will not touch us. We have passed from death to life. The second we find is that Jesus removed our sin from us. As the leaven was removed from the house, the, Jesus removed our sin from us. As far as the east from the west, he removed our sins from us and us from it. The third that Jesus sanctifies the firstborn for himself, the first fruits. And we are birth of Jesus Christ, born in him, born again to be the first fruits unto him. And we give honor and glory to God. And the last, we are delivered and sealed by his mighty power. The same power that brought the children of Israel out of Egypt is the same power that lives in us today. There's power in the blood. These are true for every believer. Are they true for you? Has Jesus redeemed you from sin? Has he erased all of your sin? Has he removed your sin? Are you living for him? We are not as Christians called to observe these specific feasts that he gave to his people, but we learn from them. As he said, remember the things of old. And as the Bible tells us, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for us, 
for doctrine. That's the truth that we just declared, the truth that he declared that we live by. For, for doctrine, for correction, when we go astray and we need to be corrected from that, the, the scripture shows us where we have misstepped. It also brings us back to him and it instructs us in righteousness. That's the purpose of all of these things. As we go through these and we remember that these four, being the spring feasts, are all already fulfilled. The next time we come together, we're going to take a look at the fall feasts, the ones that have yet to come to pass. And the Jews will be observing that first of those fall feasts, the first the Feast of Trumpets, well, Thursday. Thursday will be their New Year's, or the first day. And um, there's just so much meaning in it for us. And I hope you're getting that out of these. It's, you know, we, we have grown spiritually. We haven't grown terribly great in numbers, but I think we're growing spiritually. And I think this adds to it when we can look into these things that God said, notice what I'm doing. I'm declaring the end from the beginning. And it helps us to see what is coming. You know, I don't see how anyone who looks at these feasts and the fulfillment of these feasts can say that God has finished with his people yet. And we know not. We, we know that he is not finished with them. Uh, in watching the news on Israel, there's many terrible times are ahead. They, the, you have Iran and you have uh, Egypt that have also already committed, and, and Syria, that if, the United States does follow through with its attack on them for their use of those chemical weapons that they, all of those countries, will immediately attack who? Not the U.S., Israel. And so they're preparing for that. That's just right around the corner. That's just right around the corner. We don't know how long is, uh, what's going to happen, but the Bible tells us that in the last days there will be wars and rumors of wars. We don't fear those things. We know that his coming is very soon, and that's why these things are so important for us to understand. And you are meant to understand these things so that you can take this to those that you know. You can express to them. Some people just need a little bit of proof. They just need a little bit of something that you just show me in the scripture how God is, what he is doing. Here it is. He's declaring the end from the beginning, and he's fulfilling it too. And it, in a way that cannot be denied. And I just want to encourage you in your witness as you learn these things, study them for yourself. Come Sunday night, tonight, and see the last of these, the Christ in the feast. It's been very enriching already, those of you that have been coming. And um, I encourage you in that. Let's close in prayer and begin to observe our Lord's Supper as we prepare our hearts. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. As we have walked through these stories from the Old Testament to the New, seeing the fulfillment of, of what you declared in the Old Testament, Lord, being fulfilled in the New. We know, Lord, that these are also the times that we live in, the time of the church age, the time of grace. And Lord, we know that your coming is soon. We can see the signs and we can tell that, Lord, just as we can know that fall is about to come upon us that we're nearing the end of the summer we know the season is about to change we know that time when you are going to come is soon right around the corner may we be ready lord may we do as you have commanded to your people to prepare our hearts to make sure that we are ready to see you so we don't have to lord when we when your children are already gone when we the church are already gone lord so that no one would have to say, oh, I waited too long. Lord, would that not be so for anyone that we have a chance to witness to and to talk to? May we be committed and so committed to you, Lord, that we will seek out those, as you did, Lord, who need to be saved. Give us the strength and power to do that, Lord. And now as we enter this time of the Lord's Supper, search our hearts, Lord, and help us to be free of the sin that we have so easily committed, that, that Lord, that you tell us in, the, in Hebrews, that sin that so easily besets us. Let us set it aside. Let us be forgiven now. And let us observe this with a clean conscience, Lord. This is our prayer and plea in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.